All right, I think we'll get started. So, um, welcome everyone to device power management. Um, my name is Jordan Yates. Um, I'm a ma maintainer of the LoRaWAN and the Seamstress Neural Network subsystems, and also a collaborator on the power management stuff, which is more relevant for uh, this talk. Um, just got a couple of uh, quick disclaimers to put away. Um, you might have noticed that the company name on the uh, schedule differs from what was on the slides. Um, so I'm no longer a CSIRO employee. I'm presenting this work with the, with the permission um, of the CSIRO in a personal capacity. And all work here was funded by the CSIRO. And I'm very appreciative that they gave their permission for me to still present this. Uh, just quickly for those who may not be aware, um, just some quick abbreviations. So yep, I'll, I'll be using, so A is like ampere, so current, milliamps, microamps, rule of tilde is approximately PM, power management subsystem, and power consumption is like, I use, I use power consumption as current more so than microwatts, just because it's easier for me. So why do we care about power consumption? Well, the power you use needs to come from somewhere. Um, for mains powered devices, at least based on Australian um, electricity, one amp continuously over a year is about nine bucks Australian, so six dollars US. Um, it's not a huge amount, it's not nothing. Maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't. Um, but for battery powered devices, it's basically the most critical part of the whole, well, one of the most critical parts of the whole design. Um, if you can reduce your power consumption, you can have smaller batteries. If, you, if your battery stays the same, you need to swap the battery less, or you can have a smaller solar panel or something. Um, a lot of applications just have inherent size and weight restrictions. If anyone attended my talk yesterday with the cattle ear tag, there is just a certain size you cannot go beyond, otherwise it's a animal ethics problem. Um, and reducing the power consumption makes it much easier to hit that energy neutral state of the amount of energy I'm using is, is less than or equal to the amount of energy that's coming in. So your device will operate indefinitely versus your device will run for two weeks. So what sort of battery lifetimes are we talking about? I've just taken a standard off-the-shelf coin cell battery. Um, it is a small coin cell battery, um, but for, say, a 650 milliamp hour capacity, the difference between hitting one milliamp average current consumption, which might be 27 days, versus 10 microamps, where it's seven years, like, in an absolute sense, the difference between one milliamp and 10 microamps may not be a lot, but in terms of lifetime, it can be a really big, um, have a really big impact. So this is a bit of a journey. So what hardware are we looking at for this? So um, inside of the CSIRO, we had a whole range of kind of general purpose development platforms. Um, and then for different projects, we would design custom hardware. But this is one of the, the general platforms. So it's a Nordic-based microcontroller. Um, it has multiple radios, it has Bluetooth from the SOC, it's got a, a LoRa modem, it's got a uh, U-Box GPS modem, it's got a whole range of sensors, accelerometers, IMUs, environmental, light. It's got a audio codec for um, microphones, I don't think it has a speaker out. Um, it's got your battery man management so um, stuff, it's got an external SD card, it's got onboard flash. Like, it's got a lot. Um, so, when you're designing something like this, you sort of, like, when you go to design a piece of hardware, you have an overarching goal of the thing you want it to talk lower away and you want to measure temperature or whatever. But you also have sort of probably a, a budget of some description for power consumption. So when you're first looking at this, you're like, okay, well, what parts do I want to put down? And what, what am I likely to actually hit in terms of power consumption? So for us, the way we normally do this is we um, essentially, for each thing we're doing, like for each functional block we want, we basically scan through the options, find the part number which works the best for us. And then there's essentially two, two numbers here that matter. So one is the amount of power that a device will use when you just, you apply power to it and you do nothing. That here is what I've called the boot power consumption. And then there's the minimum power consumption. So if you configure it in the best way you can, 
what power consumption will you hit then? And for some of these sensors, they're the same number. They boot up into their lowest power mode. But for others, that's very much not the case. So GPS modems, for example, are sort of notorious for you turn them on and they start running. 30 milliamps versus 15 microamps, that's a lot, right? So, but if you're looking for what's the theoretical minimum power consumption of, of your hardware, it's the minimum you're looking at. So I've got a list of yeah, these parts here, uh, continued here, and total. Now, you may remember from the start of the, uh, well, the title of the presentation, Journey to 5 Microamps, and then you look at that total um, minimum there, 300 microamps, well, we're sort of already in trouble, right? Like, how, how are we going to hit 5 microamps with what's, got, what, what's going on there? And just, like, the, the boot current as well is just ridiculous. That's never, never going to work. But no one says that all of your parts always need to be powered, right? Um, for parts which just draw too much power, even in the absolute lowest power state, you can just cut the power to them. And sure, that, that adds a part, then that part itself draws, draws current, but that's like 0 0.02 microamps. So you add 0 0.02 microamps, you remove 100 microamps, milliamps, whatever it happens to be. Um, now, it's obviously not free. There's a, there's a cost, a physical, like a, not a physical cost, an actual cost to the, the, um, the hardware component itself. There's also a software cost, right? Like your, your software is now more complex. And cutting the power also adds, um, it's, it's, there's a hardware cost as well in terms of complexity, right? Like there's more things to be aware of. Like if you cut the power, if you, yeah, if you cut the voltage on the power pin, but your communication bus is still powered, well, it's, quite likely that power actually just flows back through those com communication pins and then sort of half powers the peripheral and then it's real annoying. So there's, there's more stuff to be aware of. Um, it, can, it can mean you need stuff like um, essentially switches on the, on the communication lines as well. So how does this work on our, um, on our development platform? So essentially we well, throw on PowerPoint, we throw in what, what the minimum power is for all these peripherals. And then we sort of just partition those off based on what is always low power enough to just be always powered. What, um, and also like what things are likely to be used together, right? Now, you could, you could put all of the high power stuff on a, um, off a single switch and that would save you uh, part numbers and stuff. But if you put your micro SD card and your GPS modem on the same switch. Every time you want to write to your SD card, you've got to turn on your GPS modem, takes half a second to boot, 30 milliamps while it's running. So you, you need to be like cognizant of your application, what's likely to be turning on at what times, and sort of split your, um, split your, your power you know, in, um, in a way that makes sense for that. I guess this really comes back to the fact that like, power management is inherently a, a hardware thing. Um, you can't just write really good software and suddenly get really good power consumption. It is a holistic thing of hardware plus software. So we've made our hardware, we've done our power domains. Now we get to Zephyr. So, okay, we've, we've, we've done our device tree, blah, blah, blah. We boot up upstream Zephyr. We run samples, hello world, flash it, and then we, how much power does it draw from the, from the uh, battery connector? Um, just as, as a side note, I guess, um, a lot of these graphs are from, um, measured using an Audi Arc. Um, I would not, have included, would not have included this like three weeks ago, but they've really updated their licensing to be much more uh, user friendly, so I'm happy to give them the plug now. <laughs> um, so we flash this application and we hit two milliamps. Now, that's much better than what you might have expected from the 32 milliamps boot, boot current, but the power domain drivers are not enabled and our power domains have a default off, so you get a bit better performance than what you would otherwise expect. If suddenly you just modify hello world to only, like just, just to add in the power domain drivers, well, suddenly we start, can you guys read the numbers on the, um, power or not? Sort of? No? Okay. So I'll, so uh, essentially that's just uh, 
the shaded area is just the time period over which we're measuring, and the average power consumption for that is uh, 33 microamps. And on the previous one, it was 1.94 milliamps. So 1.94, turn on power domains, 33 milliamps. And that roughly matches our calculated baseline from the first few slides. And in that case, we know, okay, sweet, there's, like, it's what we expect. There's probably no like, major hardware problems on the board. No one's thrown a 10 ohm resistor across our voltage line or whatever. So we've got our baseline. It's obviously not, not where we want to be. Um, so what do we do next? Uh, yeah, so I guess a, a bit about like Zephyr um, device power management in general. Um, applicate, oh, sorry, uh, devices always default to the active state. Now, active state typically means the device is running, it's ready to run samples, um, like to, to retrieve samples from. Uh, suspended is generally just a generic low power state, whatever that may mean for that particular device. And then you've got off where um, power has been physically removed from the device. Now, even after you turn on um, the power management subsystem, devices still default to active. So just by turning on power management, you don't, you don't get any savings by default. So you need to take explicit action to get improvements from um, device runtime. And this doesn't, this doesn't only apply to like external peripherals as well, it's also internal SOC blocks which may be powered or enabled or disabled or whatever. So UART, SPI, whatever. Some of these are more relevant than others. An R2C bus left on, doesn't really matter. UART left on, matters, matters a lot. So some software guidelines, my opinions contained inside, beware. So basically the, the, the first the first opinion is that basically all drivers for all devices on the board should be enabled unless you have a very good reason. And the reason for that is because, as, as you saw in the, in the table, there's a difference between what the boot power is and low power mode is. If you don't have a driver for that device, there's no way to go from one to the other. And there's an argument that could be made there about maybe there's some alternate, like minimal driver which only contains the transition logic, which could be like a future, future improvement for the power management stuff. but that's neither here nor there at the moment. Um, all instances of those devices, at least those that have a difference between um, the boot and the, and the minimal power consumption, should have device runtime PM enabled. If you don't have it enabled, they will be in active mode and you will get boot, not minimum. Um, that also implies that all drivers in that application need to be implementing PM if you turn on PM on a device, but it's not implemented in software, well, it's not gonna do anything, right? Um, and this is true for all applications, even if you're only using a subset of the, of the hardware. If your board is only measuring temperature once a minute, but you've got a GPS modem there, you still need the GPS modem to be enabled and, run, and, to, and um, like in running uh, runtime PM for it to actually be put into a low power state. So luckily, enabling all drivers is easier now than it was in the past. Um, they're basically, most drivers these days are sort of just automatically enabled if they exist in device tree and if they're enabled. Um, sensors is okay, because most of the time you turn on sensor anyway. But for some other drivers, it's, it's worthwhile being aware of the um, high level dependencies. So um, that's a good example. Um, I think like the audio codec, at least in my tree, sits under like a, a high level audio um, option. So if you don't turn on the audio subsystem, then your audio codec won't be enabled. So if you're trying to figure out why a device isn't running or whatever, obviously check like your autoconf file. And if it's not enabled, well, start looking for some high level dependencies or run GUI, GUI config or whatever. Um, so how do we actually turn on device runtime PM for all devices. Um, obviously you can do it manually at runtime in your application with um, the, the function PM device runtime enable. The problem or challenge with that is that your application then needs to know every piece of hardware which is gonna be on your board, which is fine for a single piece of hardware, 
but if you're trying to run the same application across three different boards, well, unless you just throw a whole mess of if defs in your like main initialization code, you're not going to actually hit all of these things. So a couple of months ago, a year ago, whatever it was, um, I contributed um, PM device runtime auto. So this is a device tree level flag. Um, you can set it in your in your board files for each device that, where this matters. And essentially what happens then is that after your device init function runs, it will automatically turn on device runtime PM for that device and um, transition it from to its lowest power state. So without having to do anything in your application land, your devices will automatically transition to whatever the lowest power mode they will support um, yeah, from the software you've written. Um, it is using device tree to configure software in some ways that may annoy purists, but like device tree is the mechanism we have to do per instance configuration. Kconfig is not really, and Kconfig has tried to transition away from that as much as possible, because it used to be like UART0, UART1, UART2, enable, and it was just a, a giant mess. Um, and this, this only does anything as well if PM device runtime is enabled. If you have those flags in your board device tree and one, app, and one application doesn't need it, it would just be ignored. So there's no cost to um, putting this flag on devices which support um, device runtime. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so for all of this to make any difference at all, all drivers need to actually implement power management. Um, as uh, Flavio said in the very first um, presentation of the conference, um, it's Conceptually, it's pretty easy to implement. There's only a single, a single callback that you need to actually uh, write. And that's basically a, um, a switch statement of this is the action that some higher level wants you to take. Do that thing. Um, what we got here? Right, so when you start thinking about power management and initializing devices, there's um, there's other considerations to, be, to take, right? Like the init function runs at boot, but all of a sudden you've got devices sitting on power domains which aren't necessarily powered, right? So what does initialization mean if you physically can't talk to the device? And how do you set up your init function to actually do that properly? Now, that's sort of a hard problem, but then when you realize that initializing the device is essentially just treating it as if you've just powered it up. Well, that's just what the PM control callback is doing, right? So um, another thing I've contributed somewhat recently is this thing called PM device driver init. So the idea behind this function is that your core initialization code only sets up software data structures, so sets up a GPIO callback, like the, the structure, not the actual GPIO. Um, it sets up the like a work queue item or whatever needs to be done for your particular driver for software. And then what happens is you essentially provide, you at the end of your init function, you finish it with PM device driver init, your device and the power management callback. And what that does is that function automatically looks at the power state of the device. Is it powered, is it not? And runs the appropriate, um, runs the appropriate actions to bring up that device properly. So if it's powered, it will run PM device turn on. If it's not powered, it will just do nothing because there's nothing to do. Um, but the real advantage of this is that if power management isn't turned on at all, it will just run action turn on, action um, active, action resume, whatever, yeah, resume. And what this actually means is that even for people who don't care about power management at all in their applications, they're actually still testing the logic of those power, of those power management callbacks. So it gets a lot more, because like, at least from my view of how people are using it, it's a relatively probably underused subsystem in Zephyr, and actually exercising these, these callbacks and stuff is not necessarily well tested. But in this case, it's, it's a, single log, a single flow of logic, no matter whether power management is enabled or, or not. And that really simplifies drivers and actually supporting it properly. Um, oh, sorry. The other thing to do in init is to configure the hardware as if it doesn't have um, device, if it doesn't have power applied, whatever that may mean in that context. Probably it means um, driving GPIOs to like 
um, ground instead of floating or whatever. All right, so you've got your hardware, you've got your software, um, or sorry, you've got your hardware, you've got some drivers, you measure your power consumption, and you're like, oh, this is more than I wanted. What are some cheap wins I can do without, well, what some cheap wins I can get without actually doing necessarily too much work, because I've got to ship next week or whatever. So UART is typically, um, is, is commonly used for like logging and shell commands. Um, normally that means that receiving is turned on for shell, so you can arbitrarily type on your laptop to reboot or whatever. But UART receiving is a power hog. Um, on the 52840 at least, um, receiving, like having the UART receive running is just 1.1 milliamps immediately. So that's like what? 200 times more than what our baseline current consumption is just for turning on the UART shell. If you don't use the UART shell, there's no reason to have that running, right? So you can turn it off. Um, a lot of these things are naughty specific because that's what we typically use because they have sort of great idle behaviors. Um, for Nordic, um, many peripherals depend on the high frequency clock when they're enabled. So if you leave, say like the SPI bus on, I, I may get this wrong if someone from Nordic can yell at me if I do. Um, but like if the, if the SPI um, peripheral is still on, even if you're not using it, the high frequency clock is still on and that costs you some amount of current depending on, um, on the crystal you've got connected. So turning off things, even if you're like, if you're not using them, turning them off can get you wins. This only helps if you're turning off everything which needs the high frequency clock. If there's still one thing that needs it, you're out of luck. Um, this is back at the hardware design stage, but internal oscillators, generally a bad time for everyone. Um, poor accuracy, poor stability, and they draw a lot of power. Um, yeah. um, DC DC converters, if you've got them on the board and you've populated the inductor and the capacitor or whatever, make sure you're like turning on the, the K-config options or whatever that actually enables it. Um, converting the energy instead of burning it in an LDO always helps. Um, LEDs, are, um, they're nice and pretty and make users happy, but they also draw a lot of power, especially for something like a coin cell where peak current is limited. Um, bright LEDs can easily hit 20 milliamps, and if you're using like one of those NeoPixels and stuff, you just, yeah, your power measurements go out the window. So tuning, toning that back as much as possible um, is definitely a win from a power perspective. So, uh, iterative improvements. So, okay, you've, you've looked through the cheap wins, you've, you've saved some milliamps or microamps or whatever, but you're, still not, you're, you're most likely still not hitting the, the theoretical minimum of your hardware. So what do you start doing next? So this is where this table where you create back at the very start of the process really comes, into, um, comes in handy. Because basically what you can do is you can, you can run your sample application and go, all right, sweet, it's using 30 milliamps currently. You look back at your table and go, okay, well, what's a peripheral where like there's a 30 milliamp difference, right? And you go, all right, sweet. It's using 30 milliamps more than I expect. My GPS uses 30 milliamps. That's probably the cause of the problem, right? Not always the cause, um, but a lot of the time it is. So essentially, yeah, calculate the difference, iterate over those potential causes, like turn on power management, turn off power management, see if things change, try and just narrow down the problem. Um, obviously, the individual problems are many and varied, so I can't really provide general, um, <laughs> general software um, development tips. But um, yeah, basically, like you try, you try and resolve the issues one by one, as, as you do with any problem, um, and then you keep repeating until the measured current matches what you expect. Now, because this is actually sort of because you're looking at the total difference, this actually gives you the biggest wins first. So if you're time limited, this is actually quite a useful way of doing it, doing it, because if you've got something which is using 100 microamps more than it should, you're not going to notice something that's using 10 microamps more than it should, right? You're going to end up fixing the 100 microamps first. And this, this, this process also ensures that there's no sort of regressions as you fix one driver, right? Like you fix one driver and the power consumption goes up, you're like, oh, something else is, um, something else is going wrong. Um, this is actually basically what I just said. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that if it's using 100 microamps more, that could be two drivers using 50 microamps more, right? So it's not always a one-to-one -one mapping, but um, it's a useful first thing to look at. 
Um, and if the driver doesn't implement PM, implement it. If it already implements it, yeah, get and put the device while you're measuring the current. If you get and put the device and the current consumption doesn't change, well, you know something's going wrong, right? Um, pin configuration. So floating pins are a pretty common cause of like just weird current consumptions. So down the right there, you can see like that's, that's a power consumption, like a, a current um, curve, not a voltage curve. And it looks like weirdly analog. And it's, you know, it doesn't really match what you would expect. And this is typical of like the back powering problem that I um, mentioned back at the start. Um, like just floating pins in general, weird analog voltages, digital devices don't like that, then they have odd behaviors. So if you see something like this, it's probably a pin configuration issue. It's not being driven low, it's not being driven high, something like that. Um, another typical cause is just like there's a voltage across some resistor somewhere, right? So if you, um, yeah, if, if you see that, okay, my power consumption is um, 100 microamps and my system voltage is 3.3 volts, well, do I have any 33K resistors? Please don't correct my maths. Um, <laughs> like, do I have any resistors of that size on my board? If you do, go around with the multimeter and just see if there's any, see if there's voltages across that, because you may find that, yeah, like some pin you didn't realize you're driving low when the, def when the other side of it is high, and that's, again, a sort of easy win, right? Um, if you are using power domains, make sure the power domains you expect to be off are actually off. Um, if they are still on, um, it's potentially because of unbalanced get and put. So if you request the device twice and only release it once, well, it's going to stay on. Um, and if you start running out of ideas, grab a multimeter, start poking around and um, see if you can find any weird voltages, because that often leads you to other root problems. So if, if you find 1.4 volts on a 3.3 volt board, you need, probably need to look into that. If you find 2.5 volts on a Nordic LTE modem, that's the reset line. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, when you start getting super frustrated, you start looking at errata documents. Um, this should probably be a thing you look at earlier in the process, but I always end up forgetting. And just do a brief skim for anything which contains the words power or increased or whatever. And then at that point, you're like, okay, well, does it apply to what I'm actually doing? And is there a workaround already being um, applied? So I've picked on Nordic here because I have nice documentation and it was the easiest one I could find. But if, in this case, if you just try and stop a timer, it's high power consumption. If you're using timers, that's bad. If you're not, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, errata is a, most of the time it's not errata, but when it is, it's really annoying. <laughs> Other things, maybe your board is perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> is there an LED on your programming adapter? Um, for that Loki board, when you plug it into the programmer, it's an extra 300 microamps because there's a little blue LED on there which tells you it's powered. So like, you've got to keep that sort of stuff in mind, right? Um, if your JTAG is still physically connected to the device, um, that's going to add you add 30 microamps because they've got an internal resistor on that uh, VDD sense pin, right? So if you're sitting at 30 microamps above where you are and you're tearing your hair out, but your JTAG is still connected, well, there's your problem. And it was nothing to do with your board or your software, it's just the measurement setup, up, right? Um, if you're running GDB or RTT, that's easily gonna add milliamps. Um, again, picking on Nordic for the, um, <laughs> the LTE um, chipset, if you connect GDB and then disconnect, it doesn't go back to low power, you need to power cycle the thing. Um, and maybe your test board is just physically broken Try another one. Hopefully, you got more than one. <laughs> um, and the other thing is that, like, when you get start getting down to the really low power consumptions, the environmental temperature actually does matter, or at least I'm pretty sure it does. Um, if you measure one day and it's four, and one day it's four and a half, and the next day it's three and a half, probably don't worry about it too much. It's probably just something environmental, or your um, your measurements, your measurement hardware is warmer because the cat's been sleeping on it, or whatever. Um, right, so I've been speaking lots of software things. So basically, after applying all of this stuff, um, again, I'm aware you probably can't read the numbers. Um, so this is um, 
that's the development platform. The spikes are like just waking up every 10 seconds to go, yes, this thing is actually alive and not just powered off. Um, so you average the power consumption over that time window, and the average there is 6.1 microamps. So I lied a little bit in the title, 6.1, not 5, but I measured it the next day and it was 4.9, so what are you going to do? <laughs> okay, so we've got a nice baseline. Our board is now low power. Are we done? Well, no, because all you've got is a board which is low power. It doesn't actually do anything useful yet, right? So, yeah, our board boots into low power state. After you start using things, will it return to that low power state? Because it's not the same thing. So, the sort of flow you want to go is, okay, well, can I at least get it to low power to start with? And then it's, okay, after I use the parts on the board, does it go back to that low power state? And only at that point you're like, okay, right, my board is good, my drivers are good, now I can start being smart about the application and turning things on and off when I actually need them. So a really good tool for doing this is a validation application. Um, and basically the purpose of this thing is, it, um, basically it, it just uses every driver on the board, right? It writes to Flash, it reads from Flash, it turns on the accelerometer, it reads samples, it measures the environmental temperature, it tries to get a GPS fix, whatever. Whatever's on your board, it should be using in whatever way it possibly can. And then you let that application run, and then when it's done, you measure the power consumption again. Is it the same after as it was before? If yes, absolutely great, because it means you've, you've, like your drivers are good. If not, it means that, well, your transition up from low power might be good, but maybe your transition back down to low power has missed the GPIO, or has left the SPI bus on, or something, right? And because we know that the board is low power when it boots, it actually makes it really easy to find out where that problem is because you just turn off the test for individual drivers and as soon as the board goes back to low power, you know, huh, that's the driver which is causing my problems. And that's when you go dig in. And this is not only for like testing low power, right? Like you have an application which validates that the board boots into low power and that all of your stuff on the board works. That sounds like a great idea for like a manufacturing test application, right? Um, well, this is basically what I just said. Um, yeah, disable test until you find a misbehaving one. Um, yeah, great. All right. Your hardware's been proven to be low power. Your drivers have been proven to be low power. Now it's time to write application firmware. And this basically comes down to think critically about when data is needed. Um, request things when you need them, if you no longer need them release them. Um, if you're getting a GPS fix every minute, but you only ever want to send it every five minutes, well, why are you doing that, right? Like, it costs you energy. And that's just like, that, that, com that comes back to your application requirements and just being smart about what you're doing. Um, but basically, as you keep developing, keep, keep uh, profiling that application and compare it to the baselines. Normally, in your application process, you can find a spot in time where it's not really doing anything. And you can sort of measure that power consumption and go, okay, well, when my application isn't doing anything and it's, it's still either the minimal, the minimum power consumption or I understand why it's not the same thing. All right, that's it. Any questions? Hopefully that was useful. Uh, hey, thank you for your talk. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, one question about the uh, device tree option uh, you mentioned you introduced. Uh, it's not used when the kconfig option is not enabled. What would be the potential cost of having that as a default for everything? Um, the cost, I suspect, would be, I think, a power management subsystem just prints out warnings when you try and turn it on for something which doesn't have it, ena doesn't have it um, enabled. The actual cost, I believe, is, I don't believe is anything. Um, that's, actually, that's a good point. I haven't actually hadn't thought of that. Um, there are some drivers where the power management stuff is sort of 
abused in some ways to um, do things non-standard. Um, and I'm, I'm as guilty of that as anyone with out of tree stuff. Um, so you may cause problems there. Um, but in general, it's probably a good idea. Well, it would be a good idea if power management was sort of more um, supported, I guess, in drivers. Uh, so if I wanted to study a particular uh, driver that does a really good job of power management, do um, you have any recommendations? Like is the, the BMA 400 a good one? Or is there even maybe a whole open source application that does uh, a good job at low power as a reference? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, so <laughs> uh, I'm not exactly proud of this, but a lot of those drivers there, even though there are drivers in tree, I'm not using those drivers in tree because power management, a lot of this stuff was written several years ago when power management was in a worse state. Um, and I have my own APIs for accelerometers and stuff, so it doesn't really make sense. Um, like, there's actually relatively few drivers in tree that do this properly. Um, the SPI flash driver, um, SPI NOR, um, does a decent job if you ignore the idle in deep power, deep power down state stuff. Um, but yeah, the SPI NOR is, probably, is the one that comes to mind because um, it does the, um, the uh, PM device driver in it and well, it doesn't turn on the um, device tree flag, but yeah, it, it, does, this, it does the software properly. Uh, so it's regarding the first question, why this option, it's not enabled by default. So the, the reason it's because there are two types of power management for the device. There is this that it's the runtime power management, but there are certain devices that don't use this, that they use the system manage power management for the device, that it's basically, they want it to be suspended only when the SOC it's being idle. So if you enable this, definitely this will mix it with this other behavior. So the device has to, you know, opt to, uh, to select this option if it's really needed. Yeah, thanks, Valia. Um, yeah, sorry. The Nordic SOCs don't actually implement system power management, so I sometimes forget about it when I'm talking. But this is device runtime power management, not system power management. And yes, that option would conflict with. Yeah. Um, so thank you. It was a great, uh, great talk. Um, so once your application is doing everything that you want and so on, and you reach uh, the expected level, um, how can you? ensure that there are no regression in an automated fashion uh, on your following developments? Do you have, um, without having you too much complex hardware stuff to? So, um, I missed part of the PyTest talk that was yesterday, but, and we don't, we don't currently have like hardware in the loop testing for this sort of stuff, um, but it was definitely on the roadmap to sort of get hardware in the loop testing in CI where essentially the only application that really matters, well, not the, only, not the only one that matters, but the one for the most bang for the buck is that validation application. If your CI runs that validation application, it, all, it tests all your drivers, and then you have a uh, Nordic Power Profiler kit on the end of it, or an Audi Arc, or whatever you've got to measure power, you could hook that into PyTest, and after that test is finished, measure the power consumption, and then validate that, push it to the cloud somewhere, whatever. So you could track that over time. Applications are more complex because depending on the point in time that you measure it, you're gonna get different values unless you average it over like a representative time thing, but that may take too long for CI. Like basically for us, we make a new release, flash it, and then hook it up to our power, power thing for a few hours and just go, is this still what we expect? Thank you for the presentation. I've got a question in this uh, iterative process in which you're trying out different drivers and devices. Um, are there any means on the shell right now to get the state of the device, the power management state, and probably like try to set it to this different states to actually see interactively as you're optimizing towards that? I'm wondering if that's something that's in the tree right now. So there possibly is, but this comes back to sort of my, in the, in the cheap wins part, right? Like UART receiving is expensive. And so that may be helpful for stuff like a GPS driver, but when you're trying to get down to the lower levels where the difference is like 10, 20, 30 microamps, those differences are gonna be swamped by whatever the UI is doing, right? So 
the shell sort of implies that you, are, you're, you have UART turned on, right? And most of the time, your problems are not with, oh, I forgot to turn my GPS driver off because that's blindingly obvious. It's with the last 10, 15, 30 microamps, and you can't afford to have the shell on when you're doing that. Cool. Um, is there anything that you can do with simulators to help reduce power usage? Like, is there any sort of testing that you can do on a simulator before you get access to the hardware? Um, I mean, anything is possible. Um, <laughs> it's like just conceptually, I think it's a hard problem because like hardware is complicated and trying to simulate, like tr or trying to emulate, I guess, the behavior of different devices. Like the amount of time it would take you to write a simulator for like the a U box GPS modem, like that's going to be like a multi year effort, right? Because like that's what their company is. It's a simulator which they turn into an actual, <laughs> an actual thing, right? Um, there's possibly some easy wins, um, but for us, especially with like when we start when we've done multiple hardware like platforms, there's a lot of commonalities between the platforms in terms of peripherals. So you actually most of the time have most of the drivers you already need. Um, so there's not. Waiting the extra couple of weeks for the hardware to arrive is not normally a huge deal because you have a previous hardware iteration, which is mostly what you need. And if it's not, you buy a dev kit, whack it on the shield, and yeah, it's not ideal, but it's a hard problem to solve, in, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, two final questions, I think. <laughs> Just a short comment on that. Uh, I'm working on a simulation framework uh, called Renode, and we've been discussing that in multiple contexts. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's very SOC specific, very hardware specific, but uh, if you're working on a, on a series of products or similar products, what you can do and, and what we've been experimenting with is just by analyzing which peripherals do you access, which registers do you access, try to do some kind of uh, or compar get comparative results between different versions of your software with some additional knowledge about the SOC, about the, the device configuration, you can try to reason about it. It's of course not ideal, but, but you can get comparative results between versions of your software, and that gives reasonable results. So now that you've uh, gone through all of this process multiple times, contributed quite a few uh, features to the uh, power management subsystem in Zephyr. Uh, do you think we still miss functionality there? What's the future of power management, as, uh, specifically device power management? Yeah, so back when I first started, however many years ago that was, I had a whole host of stuff out of tree for power man management, especially like at the subsystem level. Um, these days there's barely anything, if, if anything. Um, I think the core of power management, um, at least device runtime, um, I'm not really plugged into the system stuff. I think device runtime is in a, a really good spot. It's got the functionality it needs. It, it solves problems. Um, where the project as a whole is lacking, I would say, is just driver support. Um, I really don't see any drivers upstream that well, there is very few that actually try and do it properly. And I think it's because, well, a lot of sensors and stuff are just contributed by passes by. They don't, probably don't have the hardware set up to actually measure that, and even if they did, they may not care. So, like, I don't think it's worth blocking sensors because they don't support it. But, yeah, it's up to the people who care, I guess, to improve that situation. What about the, um, uh, the built-in, the SOC IP blocks? Uh, the, are those usually well implemented in terms of uh, power management, as per your experience? Um, are you trying to get me to praise Nordic? Like generally? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I'm, no, no I'm saying general because you, you use other chips as well, don't you? Uh, not actually for SOCs, no. Okay, um, all right, all right like fair enough. Historically, deep pass, yes, but that wasn't Zephyr. Right, right. Um, yeah, for Nordic drivers at least, yes, powering things on, powering things off works well. Um, pin control as well has also been a big improvement in this respect because um, one of, some of the outer tree stuff I had was okay. Well, I turn off the SPI bus, but now I have to manually configure all these pins into weird states. Right. Pin control solves that, which is great. Yep. Um, which helps with those like floating pin issues that we were seeing. Um, but yeah. Great. Glad to hear that. Okay, we are on time. <laughs>
he'll want to say a, 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 Dick, a Dixie question, Daisy Dick, whatever the, no. 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 This is just, just a, a sort of a comment, but um, one thing that you, I think you missed was the, the, the final nuclear option of having to desolder off some chips. Sorry, yes. Because that does, sometimes chips lie about their absolute minimum power. If you no longer have any hair left from ripping it all out and you have a suspicion based on whatever, you grab out your soldering iron, you pull that chip off and see if it fixes it. Um, <laughs> you don't like doing that, and if you have one, you may not want to do that, but it's a solution. Okay, thank you. Thank you.